Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. Um, just a quick note, we are recording this meeting. I am also admitting people while speaking to you. So, um, so far we have about 38 guests. We're so pleased everyone could join today. And I hope you're all doing well and enjoying your summer. Um, I'm Marianne Vernetson. I'm the Associate Director here at the Graham Center for Public Service, and I'm fortunate to get to put together programs like these for our students. Um, we have all of you muted, so we would ask you after our panelists make their presentations, if you want to ask a question, you can either raise your hand and we'll select you and you would unmute yourself, introduce yourself with your name and maybe your major, or you can drop your question into the chat function here on Zoom. We do have someone on the back end monitoring that. Um, and the program will be archived on the Graham Center website and you'll be able to access it after today in case you are have to leave early or wanna share it with a friend. So we know you have a lot of questions and we're excited to hear from our panelists and ready to get started. They will each present for a few minutes about their current position and some general background. I'll follow that up with one question for the group. And finally, we'll open the floor to you and spend the, the remainder of the time answering your questions. So first is Leanna Guerra. She's the Deputy Chief of Staff to US Representative Darren Soto and actually serves on the Graham Center Council of Advisors. Dominic Tao is a Foreign Service Officer with the US Department of State and also a fellow UF grad. And Christian Pierre Canel is a Legislative Assistant with US Representative Al Lawson and a graduate of the Graham Center's Tallahassee Internship Program. So Liana, would you like to start us off? Yeah, sure, thank you so much. And I wanna just thank the Bob Graham Center for inviting me, especially as an alum. I'm so proud to see how much it's grown and I'm very passionate about the center that really got my career in public service started. Um, so just a little bit of background about myself and I'll briefly talk about um, my journey to public service, but I'm from Miami. I was born to Cuban American parents. I'm a soon to be double gator. I'm actually, so I graduated in 2015 with a degree in economics, in political science, and a minor in Latin American studies. And then I um, uh, decided to pursue an MBA. It's a hybrid program, so I'm based in Washington, DC. Um, but I get to go to campus every four months um, and meet with my cohort. So I'm graduating December this year crossing my fingers uh, that will graduate in person, but we'll see as everything is very fluid right now. But um, during my time at, at UF, I was very invo involved with the Bob Graham Center. I was in the inaugural Ruben Askew Scholars Program in, I think it was 2012. I also did the Tallahassee Internship Program, which I highly, highly recommend this program. Um, it got my foot in the door in public service and actually where I was placed, was with then State Senator Darren Soto, who is now my current boss in Congress. So I thank the center for my job. <laughs> and um, I was also involved in other areas on campus that I was personally passionate about, um, specifically the Hispanic Student Association and um, the Hispanic Latino Affairs, La, La Casita, um, and the Samuel Parker Oral History Program. So those are some of the areas that I was involved in and really made a huge impact um, on my life and really my journey to public service. So I just wanted to highlight, I think, two of the key things. Um, for me, what has helped me in my career, it has not really been the classes I took, but really have been my internships and my involvement. So, so internships, kind of like I mentioned, um, Tallahassee program, that was really, I, it was, I was a sophomore when I did the program and, um, it's a full-time program in Tallahassee. Again, it was a place for the state senator, but that's when I really uh, started to learn what the legislative process looked like. Um, since you're there for the full 60 days of session, Tallahassee has a very short session and it's jam-packed with a lot of things that you learn. And for me, that kind of solidified like, wow, this is how I'm going, I want to make a difference in my community is through the legislative process and through um, uh, politics. Uh, I did a couple other internships as well that really made an impact in my life. I, one summer, uh, I did an internship, internship in DC um, with the Democratic National Committee. Um, at the time, the chairwoman was Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who's also a Gator grad. And um, I stayed in touch with my uh, supervisor and a year later um, was able to actually get hired on. And so my first job out of college I drove up to DC, 
two days after graduating and started working at the DNC and worked there for about a year and a half throughout the 2016 presidential election. And subsequently I worked on the, on the Hillary campaign too. Um, and then after that is where I landed my current job in Congress, which I've been here for in my role for three and a half years now. Um, but I also wanted to highlight how involvement really played a role, not just my internships, but like I said, I was, um, you know, involved with the Hispanic Student Association. I was president my senior year um, and just did different, also involved with the oral history program and different groups on campus. But for me, why I want to highlight that is because through those experiences, I gained a significant amount of leadership skills. I learned how to, as president and, you know, in other roles that you have in organizations, I learned, learned how to manage a team, which I have to do that now. I learned, you know, public speaking. I had to speak at all our general body meetings um, and different events that we hosted. And just for me, those, when I look back at my time at UF, those are the things or the memories that I carry and, share and cherish to this day. And um, subsequently, I'm now on the UF Hispanic Alumni Board because it, was, it meant so much to me that I wanted to look, find a way to give back to students and, you know, now that I've graduated. Um, and then lastly, so that the other uh, speakers can speak, I just wanted to leave you with three little tidbits of advice. I'm sure we'll get more into it on Q&A. But one is know your why, you know, know why you want to get involved in public service and what you're passionate about. That's because typically a lot of these jobs, you have uh, long hours, low wages, and, you know, it can be mentally draining. So you just have to remember why you're passionate about what you're doing. Um, two, don't sacrifice your mental and physical well-being because it's important to set boundaries and I think it's hard to do that sometimes. We can talk more about that. And lastly, um, in your roles in the future, just always be aware of access issues, access issues and you know, change that when you're in positions of power. The reason I bring that up is that in public service, there's a lot of unpaid internships, low income jobs, um, and a lack of diversity. And I think when you, when you step into a management position, it is, it's now your duty to change that and try to pay your interns, you know, try to ensure that the people that you hire represent different communities and different groups, because um, that's how we're going to have a truly representative group of people working for the masses. So anyways, that is, that's it. And I'm sure we'll get more into Q&A. Thank you so much, Liana. Dominic, could I ask you to go next, please? Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Marianne. Um, you know, it's great hearing some of your words there. Liana, couldn't have been a better segue to one of my you know, points that I wanted to get into a little bit later. You, you touched on the, the, you know, why you want to serve. And um, uh, I wanted to talk about not just the why, um, uh, why you should devote your life and career to public service, but, you know, where does that value come from? So could have asked for a better segue. Um, but uh, um, yeah, so um, I started, I have a, as I'm sure you'll see, you saw from Liana, and I think you'll see from Christian, there's not just one career path ahead of you. Um, so the past 10 years, I've moved 18 times, worked four or five different jobs, all kind of in the same field. So I started off uh, 2008, um, uh, I was a, a journalist. Well, uh, um, I started working at the New York Times, that job went away, I started working at ABC News, that job went away because it was what, kind of like you guys, I graduated into a time of absolute chaos and, um, uh, but the good news is it does get better. These things are temporary. And, uh, you know, what I always tell myself is this too shall pass. So y'all are smart and I'm sure, um, uh, things will uh, shake out. It might seem a little bleak now, but, um, like if my, you know, path after graduating into recession is any indication, uh, just apply yourself, you know, stick to your goals and guns and it, it'll generally come out on the bright side of things. Um, but, um, but yeah, but back, back then when I graduated, um, uh, I, I did land at the St. Pete Times. I don't know if any of you are from the you know, Tampa Bay area, but it's a big newspaper down here. Um, but uh, like all newspapers in the country, um, that time um, was particularly rough and they just didn't have the resources to cover the things that uh, you know, I felt were important. Um, uh, like my, my dad is you know, an immigrant to this country and uh, funny thing is he passed the US citizenship test and I'm sure most you know, 
ma many Americans probably can do that. So for him, like basic American values were super important. He raised us like that. And so um, I felt, man, so here I am, you know, uh, 22 years old, out in the economy. And back when I was in high school, 9-11 happened. Uh, why is this still going on now? And why doesn't anybody, you know, even cover this? Uh, you know, a couple years ago, even the St. Pete Times had a reporter covering this. Now they don't. So I, I thought this, it, it just didn't sit well with me. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to, I, I just can't sit here. I need to do something about it. I need to serve, you know, in some capacity toward this defining event of my generation. And uh, just like right now, you all are graduating into what I'm sure is going to be the defining event of your generation. So, um, um, uh, and I'd like to share with you the letter I wrote to the Army um, Officer Candidate Board about why I wanted to serve. It's one of the questions they ask. And that's, you know, above every other reason I have for becoming an Army Officer is this. I've been given so much and wish to give back in a tangible way to my country, my family, and everyone who I have met and have yet to meet. There's some things in life a person must do to feel that they have lived up to what's expected of them. And for me, national service is one of those things. And so that's the why. And as the years have gone on and I've transitioned from being a soldier to now a diplomat, uh, gotten some you know perspective on just the realities of the world, like, you know, sometimes a, a meeting and a phrase and a handshake could be worth more than a, you know, Hellfire missile um, and be a lot cheaper too is, uh, um, you know, the, the you know, uh, where, where does this feeling come from? And I always link this back. And I think the best example is Uncle Ben's last words to Peter Parker, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. And so to kind of use that analogy, just by the virtue of you all being graduates or soon to be graduates of UF, that you all will, you know, you, you have been given, um, given quite a lot. And so I've always felt America is a place that if you're given something, you should always give it back to the next generation, um, you know, because uh, you've prospered, so help others prosper in return. And that, that's where my, you know, um, that's where my why comes from. So um, I, I won't uh, take any more Christian's time, but that's just a couple things that have been on my mind that I want to share with you all. <clears throat> Thank you, Dominic and Christian. Well, Dominic and Liana have made my job a lot easier. Um, so thanks for letting me go last. Um, but seriously, thank you to the Bob Graham Center. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, give back to uh, a center that has given so much to me, not just when I was a student, um, but also um, now five years in, I guess, alumnihood. Um, and so just to reiterate, my name is Christian Pierconell. I am a graduate of the University of Florida from the spring class of 2015. I'm from originally from Lehigh Acres, Florida. Um, and I had a kind of a, a flow chart of things I wanted to say, but I have to say that it's really great seeing all of your faces, uh, even through Zoom. And when Liana and Dominic talked about some of the main themes of service and why we should give, seeing kind of your faces um, brighten and start smiling, I think it's a really great sign that you're already on the right track. I think that's a, a collective consciousness there about um, our passion for service. And so I guess the best way to talk about how I got to where I am is talking about the past. And I kind of think that my four years at the University of Florida were kind of split in two themes. Uh, so my first two years, I was very involved in university-centric um, student involvement. So I did various organizations that may or may not exist anymore. <laughs> I'm starting to realize I'm getting a little bit uh, older, but you know, started um, with Freshman Leadership Council, um, and then throughout my freshman year, really got involved in, in those organizations, um, played other roles in student government. And then um, in my sophomore year, um, I, did I was involved in organizations such as preview staff. Um, even to this day, if someone was the class of 2017 and I see them somewhere, I'm like, oh, who's your previous staff? And I'm like, yeah, like I was, I was with them. Or I can kind of like, oh, you must have taken POS 2021 or, you know, INR 2001 if you're a, a poli sci major. And that was always, um, and still is kind of exciting. Um, uh, and then I started getting more into kind of policy based things such as the rights union board of managers. Um, and all while you know staying focused on 
um, my actual academics, which is really important. And after the summer that I served as a previous staffer, which was the summer of 2013, you know, I went into my junior year and I kind of felt um, not fulfilled. I think that sometimes the students, especially at a school that is so large and a school that has so much focus on kind of student involvement, sometimes we're always kind of trying to climb a ladder and climb a ladder. And sometimes you might get to a certain ring that you think you'll feel a certain way. And then you ask yourself, why don't I feel like I thought I would? You know, it's like I spent the summer doing all the gator chomps and all the stuff with students. Um, and here I am starting my junior year and still kind of hungry for, for, for more. And I really, again, had to ask myself about my why, um, which has always kind of been public service. I think in high school it was called leadership. And then, you know, you start to get involved in, in college and it's, it's service and it's student government and all of that. And I started to transition more towards beyond um, my experience in uh, between the four walls of the University of Florida's campus. And um, I got involved with the um, Political Science Junior Fellows Program at the um, Political Science Department. And then going into my senior year, I had a couple of really big decisions to make. So the summer going into my senior year, I was uh, selected for the Public Policy and International Affairs uh, Fellowship. And I was a part of the Carnegie Mellon cohort. And that was really the first time in my um, life that I was kind of thrusted into um, an experience where, you know, it wasn't really Florida centric. You know, I, people in my cohort, you know, went to Ivy Leagues, people in my cohort went to, you know, top 10 publics, which now we're in, um, you know, they went to small liberal arts schools. You know, we were from all over the, the country. Um, some of us were immigrants, um, some of us were children of immigrants like myself, my parents come from Haiti, and we were really forced to be there, you know, with the one theme, which is understanding that policy is critical towards solving problems. And for some reason, um, we have this internal call to, to get into the field of, of policy. And that was an incredible experience that really pushed me in so many ways. And I'm, I'm happy to talk more about that later. And then I go back and it's my senior year. And here I am. And probably like many of you, it's like I could technically graduate early, but I'm also a poli sci major, and I really have to get into the you know into the the market when the time is right. And what do you do as okay, cool, you have a solid GPA and you have some internships, but like what do you really have when you get your degree and it's time to go into the and time to go into the workforce? And that's when the Bob Graham Center really um, proved to be like the most pivotal part of my experience. And I decided, I always joke around, I, I gave up my senior spring in Midtown and um, I went to Tallahassee. And so I was one of, I think, two or three seniors in my uh, cohort of 10 that for our last semester at the University of Florida, we interned in the state capitol. And I interned with then state uh, representative Daryl Rusan, who is now state senator. And that experience I think was really critical. You know, every single day that was our priority was, you know, our internship in Tallahassee. And I think what was really beautiful about that, and I'm sure Dominic and Liana can also add to this, is that sometimes the best thing about an internship isn't that it's like, this is what I want to do, but this is, this is really proving that this is not what I want to do. So from, for all respect for you know, the public service officials in our state government, um, the LAs there, the, the pages and the interns, I think at that time in my life, I knew that I didn't want to be in Tallahassee. And through that, my senior spring, you know, here I am still like, what do I want to do? And I was accepted into the Congressional Block Caucus Foundation uh, internship for that summer. So again, it's kind of like another, another push, you know, it's not a job, but as, as Liana mentioned with, um, you know, really access to places, especially places of power, my CBCF internship afforded me to have a stipend, you know, housing, I lived in GW's campus, um, and it gave me two months to intern with Congressman, um, Hastings, Elsie Hastings of Florida's 20th District, um, and not necessarily have to worry about some of the financial implications of living in the top third most expensive city in the country um, without making money. And um, from there, I didn't get a job my first two months, and I had to hustle, and I had to hustle, and fortunately I got a job. I got hired with my first job within um, five months, and I guess I'll keep the, the last five years much quicker. I've had the pleasure of serving for three offices. Um, in my last two offices, I worked for Senator uh, Bill Nelson of Florida, as well as now for the past 18 months, I do policy for Congressman Al Lawson, um, who represents the other school on I-10, uh, about two hours north of us. Um, and I'm happy to answer other questions, but I just think that sometimes when I talk about my journey and the hustle and focusing on the why, um, 
it helps people with, with their journey and, and, and their whys. Thank you so much, Christian. Um, I'm looking at the time and it's about 2.21, so I wanna make sure we have time for all of our students to also ask questions. So I just have a quick round robin for the three of you. Could each of you tell me one specific skill that you think might be more useful or helpful than others? And Christian, you're unmuted, so I'm gonna let you go first. Cool. Um, I definitely think anal analytical thinking and analytical reading. Um, our jobs, I can't speak for exactly Liana or Dominic, even though I, so I know I work with Liana, she, we're literally one floor above each other in the office back when we could be in an office. But at the end of the day, often you, you are asked, what's this problem? What does this mean? What do I do about it? Um, and it's sometimes your job to condense literally 2,000 words into 50 words. Um, and then what do you do with those 50 words? That, that's a lot of the analytical part of this is your responsibility. So I think that that's critical. Liana? Sorry, I was taking, writing my oh. notes down. <laughs> um, so I think it depends. I think find what you're good at and like hone in on that. So for me, I think I've always been good or enjoyed bringing people together. So I, you know, use that in this space to, for organizing, coalition building, bringing people together around an issue that everyone's passionate about or educating them around an issue and then trying to change things that way. Cause things aren't gonna happen with one person. You have to bring people together to force people sometimes to listen to you. And I think we can see that with everything going on right now or uh, you know, a really uh, quick example, in 2013, um, I was on campus and well, actually through my Tallahassee internship program, I learned at the time that undocumented immigrants weren't able to access in-state tuition rates. So they were paying out-of-state tuition rates um, even if they went to a Florida high school. And so um, there was many students on campus that felt that this was an injustice. And so we kind of were able to identify different people in different groups and different facets on campus, bring them together. And we just created a whole new organization called Gators for Tuition Equity. We kind of branded around that and you know, hosted, uh, we did protests, we hosted panels on campus. We, I spoke at the Board of Trustees meeting and urged them to change the policy on campus. Ultimately, they said, this is not something we can do, so go to Tallahassee. So we did that, we tried to get student government on board. Um, there was a lot of steps that we took along the way to just build momentum and coalition around this important issue. Um, targeted our state elected officials, the governor, um, and ultimately in a span of like eight months of organizing, the bill did pass in Tallahassee. And now I think at that time, Florida became like the 21st state to offer in-state tuition rates to undocumented students. But I think that that story is so powerful because you recognize the power that even it was students, students mobilizing across an entire state that changed this, this law. So that's what I would say. I, I just used my ability to bring people together on an issue um, to make change. Thanks, Liana. Dominic? One word, one skill, writing. Uh, so an anecdote from uh, my time in officer candidate school just to shoot, like army, right? You're out there running around shooting missiles and guns and stuff. What, what good's writing gonna do? Well, they teach you like at the very beginning of officer training, writing is one of the most important skills. And to do that, they take everything away. No, you know, it's, it's a gentleman's course, you're an officer. So, you know, you can request privileges for things like coffee and to be able to use your cell phone once a week. But in order to acquire these basic niceties, you have to write for them. You have to write a persuasive memorandum to convince your superior officers to give you coffee, pros and cons. And I found in my career in the Army and the State Department especially, um, you know, writing is the key to anything. If you can persuade somebody with the written word on a page, uh, that'll open almost every door that I can think of, so. Excellent. Thanks, Dominic, Christian, and Liana. So I want to um, open the floor to you all. I have two questions here in the chat box already, so I'm going to start with those. Just a quick reminder, if you want to ask your question live, just raise your, use the raise hand function, um, and I'll call on you. We ask you to just say your name and your major, just so we have a little bit of background. So our first question comes from Julia. Are there career or internship opportunities that you're aware of for recent graduates? It could be in your office or someone else's. And uh, Julia, if you wanna unmute yourself and elaborate at all, please feel free to do so. Thanks, I think you uh, said it pretty well. 
I'll go first. So Julia, if I recall, I think I met you when I, on behalf of PPIA, I was at that public service expo. Um, <laughs> I saw you, um, so side note, I was at UF for PPIA. I serve on the alumni advisory board for, um, Al alumni advisory council for uh, the Public Policy and International Affairs Fellowship. And literally on March 10th and 11th, I flew down right before um, DC shut down, right before school shut down. And I believe I saw you and I believe that we, we, we had spoken. So obviously I think the pandemic, which as Dominic said, is probably going to be one of the most historic milestones, uh, especially in your generation, um, has changed a lot in um, the world and public service. It's obviously changing the way that the campaigns are campaigning. It's changing the way that uh, Congress and congressional staff are conducting our, our work. This has been my, my office, so welcome. Um, and so, or my desk, I don't have an office. <laughs> but with all that to say, I, I realized that, um, which is I think at the end of the day is important in public service, is that we've adapted. Um, how well we've adapted, that's a great question. But I know that my office, as well as other offices, are, are doing their best to um, conduct virtual internships. I, I can't speak for state, which their structure might be a little bit more uniform, considering it's a, a more um, uh, connected uh, agency compared to all of Congress, which is pretty much like 435 offices independently. Um, so I know that offices and organizations are still being proactive. I think, again, with that theme of hustle, it might take a little bit more hustle on, on, on you to do your research. Um, I know Marianne asked if we could share information public, so I'm more than happy to connect with you afterwards. Um, we can have like more of a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, with that being said, the pandemic won't make that easy, especially for recent grads. But I think that public service, especially getting your foot into that door is never easy. And this is a great way that when you look back in your career, 5, 10, 20, 50 years from now, it's like, wow, I started you know, as a congressional intern or, you know, maybe on a campaign in the middle of the pandemic and I was able to do it and it, it made that service even more important. So I'm happy to connect with you, but we are creating options for, for people to get connected. Thank you. And Christian, that reminds me, I, after this, everyone, I'm going to email those who attended and I will share um, Dominic, Christian and Liana's contact information so you all can follow up with them individually. Did anyone else want to answer Julia's question? Otherwise I have, um, Several sure. people waiting in the wing. A, a couple um, uh, pitches and some great scholarship opportunities. So um, I was able to go to graduate school at you know a private Ivy League institution because of the scholarships that are available to you know recent college grads or soon to be college grads like yourself. Um, and also, it really smoothed the path to my uh, current position at the State Department, and there's two scholarships I really would love to plug. Uh, one is the, you know, Pickering Foreign Affairs Fellowship and the Wrangell Fellowship. You know, these basically are, um, you know, uh, very substantial, like full rider close to it in many institutions, scholarships that, you know, pay for, um, you know, a master's degree for college graduates and also a path into um, uh, foreign service work. So um, they, they're, they're pretty competitive, but they're phenomenal. It's really tough to beat these. And as far as job opportunities, um, the federal government is still hiring. So um, I, I know there's probably a lot of concerns about entering the government you know, right now, um, but uh, the pipelines are long. So for instance, to get a security clearance for many jobs in the military or um, you know, the State Department, other national security roles, it can be 18 months. And um, you know things can be very different 18 months from now. So, um, uh, and another plus is in many agencies like the State Department, especially the military, with the GI Bill and tuition assistance, um, basically you could, um, you know, apply that to your any student that you have or put that toward education in the future. And um, the salaries are relatively competitive these days. Thanks, Dominic. Um, I do see, uh, just a quick note, I put something in the chat function. We will have people here talking about the Pickering, the Wrangell. Peace Corps, other things like that on July 30th. So please be sure to register for that session as well. I wanted to go ahead and call on Hannah Townley. Hannah, I see your hands raised. Hi, um, I just wanna say thank you, Leanna, Dominic and Christian um, for coming and speaking with us today. My name's Hannah. I'm going into my junior year as a political science and English double major. And I know I want a career in public service. I just don't know exactly what. I'm interested in the Foreign Service, legislative policy, advocacy. I'm interning with UF's federal relations team virtually this summer. 
So I just wanted to ask, how do you find within a broad sector such as public service, how do you define what career path is right for you? And then as you're applying for positions and trying to figure out where you have the most opportunity to make an impact, what are some good signs that a position has opportunities for meaningful change and impact? Hey, Hannah. Um, so I'll, I'll start by saying that, you know, I think in college, a lot of times you think that your first job is going to define the rest of your career and that you're going to like pigeonhole yourself. So don't don't think that way. I think it's, you know, especially in public service. I mean, I think it depends maybe what kind of if I'm, I can't speak for state, but where I'm at, you can do so many different things and even work in Congress for two years. Then, you know what, I'm going to jump on a campaign Then I'm going to go work Cons do political consulting and so I think you know first try to do the these different internships I'm glad to hear that you're already doing one um, with UF federal re relations um, and see like Christian said what you don't like see what you do like and then once you find what you do like kind of stick to that and even within that you'll see that you know for example my first job was political I was at the party Democratic Party then I worked on the campaign um, you know, sometimes another way to get into Congress or into not just Congress, but into a legislative position is sometimes through the campaign. You know, if you work on someone's campaign, they're, you know, uh, trying to get into office and then they win. That's probably a shoe in for you if you worked hard and hustled during that time and you were able to prove yourself. Um, and then you'll learn the different side and you'll find out. And even in a congressional office, it's not all policy. So for the first three years that I worked in a congressional office, I didn't do any policy. I did, um, I managed my boss's schedule and operations, um, which uh, takes a lot of work for a congressional member. Um, I also managed just like the, the, did like human resources and personnel for our 18 people team. I'm very passionate about um, providing resources to our staff and uplifting them. And so just for example, today I or organized for the house wellness center to do a whole seminar for our team about how to manage stress and you know during this very difficult time and so that's another avenue um, or communications you might be passionate about social you know how to elevate your boss's voice or you know these policy issues that are passing and, and communicate that to constituents um so there's so many different things that you can do um that's not maybe just I think people always think policy is the only way. And I do now uh, manage a couple issues that I'm passionate about, but the, you know, there's endless opportunities and it's okay to kind of jump back and forth. Um, you know, for example, I know so many friends who have left the Hill to go now work on the presidential or down ballot races, or, you know, if your party's not in the majority and there's less jobs because, you know, you can't work at the White House or in the administration, some people jump into consulting, learn that field for a couple years, and then bring that back into a public service role. Um, so anyways, for me, for example, I'm graduating with my MBA in December. Um, I think I'll stick you know, in Congress for a while longer because I'm really enjoying what I'm doing, but I'm super open. I don't know what's next for me, but I'm super open to different possibilities and kind of just taking what I learn, learn along the way. Yeah, and I'll um, follow uh, Leon on that. So, and it sounds like you're in a pretty great position, um, already experiencing, um, even though virtually, you know, experiencing kind of federal government work. Please tell Sarah I said hi, um, and I'll get back to her emails. <laughs> um, I handle our agriculture and our education portfolio, so I work with Sarah a lot between IFIS as well as um, everything happening at the University of Florida. But I do think um, a couple of points I had was. Um, not like and to put too much pressure, but since you're entering your junior year, you still have that summer between your junior and your senior year. And I think that that one is probably um, one of the more critical summers in the sense that it's kind of your last like, all right, this is it before you graduate and you're kind of thrown off into, into, into the world. Um, and I guess, you know, I'll be biased and, and throw out something like PPIA, the Public Policy and International Affairs Scholarship. As I said, I went to speak to some students uh, about that in March. And, you know, it sounds like you would be a perfect candidate where you know that you're interested in policy. You know, you have experience already in the more lobbying world of like UF federal relations. Uh, but that kind of eight week um, experience, uh, hopefully, you know, next summer in, 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 in person again at an institution um, is going to really throw a lot of the policy um, 
the analytics, the the quants, just like the reading. Um, you know, I did it in 2014, so like still five years after the ACA. And it's like, cool, here, healthcare policy in six weeks. Definitely not an expert, but that that experience I think is really important for the next step. Um, and there's another PPIA alum uh, here as well. Um, hey, man. Uh, Manuela, so plenty of gators who have done it um, that you can talk to. But even if you aren't doing that, I think what is, even if you don't necessarily want to do something like PPIA, is always ask yourself, all right, these are the things I've done, and this is what I've learned from it. This is what I didn't learn from it. This is what I've liked, and this is what I didn't like. And then if you're looking and thinking forward towards the future, what can I do that can help me build skills, help me build or go and refine towards the potential career that I would want? I think that's always an important thing. And then similar to, to um, what Liana said, you know, I've been fortunate to be here for five years. I've been fortunate to work in Congress for five years. But, you know, when I became a CDCF intern and when I hopped in my car um, two weeks after college to come to D.C., I did not think I wanted to be in Congress. I mean, I had a 13 percent approval rating. You know, I, I you know, I, I don't know if there's a lot of civic education as to like what it's really like. It really is just like a day job and you go to work and you go get coffee at nine o'clock in the morning. And I just didn't really want that at the beginning. I actually wanted to be a foreign service officer. I was initially looking at Pickering and Wrangell and, you know, interning in Congress, I thought was going to be my way to go down to Foggy Bottom and start a career in state. And then I realized, for me at least, you know, Congress is the nexus of, of kind of information and for someone who's so young to be able to touch so many various issues. Um, and there's a big difference between working in the executive branch and working in, in, in Congress. And here I am again, five years later, having been fortunate with a, a great career so far in Congress, but I'm also studying for the LSAT and also looking into, you know, connecting my um, passion for public service and a hopefully a continued career in public service uh, to utilize a law degree. Uh, and so it's okay to never know as long as you, you, you know, keep that why as you um, take those, those steps. That's great. Um, we have a couple questions here for Dominic, and I think I can sort of group them. So um, Dominic, a couple of folks would like to know, when did you know you wanted to work for the State Department? And is there anything you would have wanted to know as a recent graduate before going into the Foreign Service? Sure. Ooh, so the first one is super easy for me. So um, you can't tell by my like analogies. I, I'm really into like comic books and science fiction and stuff. And so uh, I grew up watching Star Trek The Next Generation. And John Luke Picard is like my ultimate role model of all time. And so here's a guy, he's like doing military stuff. I did that, but he, mostly he's a diplomat. He goes and like solves situations by, you know, talking to people and dealing with, you know, laws and rules and fighting for, you know, his convictions and, or, and for the organization that he represents. I'm like, growing up, I had no idea what a diplomat was really. But um, it, I was like, man, I wish there was a job like that. And so um, when I was applying for, um, graduate school, I did come across one of the fellowships I mentioned, and it's like, wait, I can actually do this sort of thing? Um, okay. And so I started reading about what, you know, being a diplomat was, and it's like, oh my gosh, this is the John Picard job. Wow. And so, um, so yeah, so it's, it's something that, um, like, kind of what, you know, Leanna said, play to your strong suit in the things you pursue. I'm like, I'm good at all these things. I love talking to people. Um, I love to travel. So this is it. Um, so that, that one, so probably since I watched Star Trek as a kid. And the other one, what did I know? Uh, or what did I wish I knew? Um, one, um, invest in Apple stock and Tesla. Um, but, no, um, but no, so the, the other one is, um, th this is so hard for me because I play a game with myself. I call it, what would five years, what, what would I think of myself five years ago? So, um, you know, I try to put myself in the mindset of who I was five years in the past. And with that mindset, think, would five years ago me approve of today me? And if I could do things differently, what would those things be? And for me, it's that time does fly very quickly. And there's so many things that I wish I had done, but just the time ran out. Um, and so always be aware of opportunity cost. You know, you might have something really, you know, shiny and great in front of you, but always be aware of the opportunity cost that you'll give up um, in, in pursuing that. Thanks, Dominic. 
Um, I guess for all of you, or you all can decide which one of you wants to answer this one. This comes from Crystal. Could anyone expand on skills to prepare to become an analyst role? So a policy analyst or an intelligence analyst. She's heard that um, there are a lot of quantitative skills like R, Python, and SQL um, that are important. And could you also reference the importance of going to graduate school? So specifically for policy analysis on the Hill, I mean, well, talking about graduate school, you don't need a graduate degree in order to work in that space on the Hill. Um, and you don't need a JD either, although there are many JDs who pursue um, these spaces. It's really more about getting into the office and then working your way up typically. Um, or even if you've worked in another, if you were like an expert in a certain field and are able to come then translate that into policy analysis. Um, for graduate school, uh, it's really, I think, specifically to Congress, um, I think it's a personal choice of what you want to do and what you think you'll get out of it. I was initially, my plan right after graduating was to pursue a master's in public administration. Um, I, I found the curriculum really interesting. I had applied to these programs um, and got in and my goal was to, you know, I, like I said, I really like managing people and, and um, kind of have always enjoyed like being on the ground and helping people. And so I kind of envisioned myself maybe looking into becoming a city manager or something like that. Um, but life kind of changed when I got a call from my old supervisor that just said that we have a job for you and if you wanted to you know take it and um, I did which is kind of what changed my trajectory and I didn't pursue my MPA and ended up working in politics which is one lesson of just being open-minded to opportunities I'm sometimes kind of like this is my path this is what I'm gonna do I'm kind of type A and have my life planned out or I used to and I have completely changed that and have been more open to opportunities. Um, I changed my personal path of not pursuing an MPA and choosing an MBA because um, I thought a lot of what I personally, I thought a lot of what I could learn in an MPA degree, I could learn on the job and I wanted to gain skill sets that, um, that a business degree could offer me if I ever wanted to open my own nonprofit or my own organization and gain those specific like finance accounting managerial skills that maybe I couldn't learn on the job um, but for my policy work right now it's really more about um, reading a lot listening to a lot of podcasts about what's going on in the world meeting with groups on the ground not as I think for me what one of my pet peeves is like don't like I don't like when people assume that they know everything I you know I want to hear from the people that it's actually impacting them and then taking that into account when thinking about policy and, and thinking about what how the legislation is going to impact people at the end of the day um so you know a lot of times there's a difference between like analysis and what looks good theoretically but what is the actual impact at the end of the day yeah i'll uh take it back um off of liana with that so i think something that um is really important for um, you all to kind of uh, discover in your journey is, is that policy, we've been using that word and you know, um, but that's, it's, it's a massive, massive cone of what that means, you know. So like I serve as a legislative assistant and so I simply say, you know, I handle policy for my boss, but I'm not crunching numbers. I mean, today I did, so I handle nutrition and today my chief was like, so how much money through like the CARES Act, I'm sure you guys have heard that term and through the, um, family first coronavirus bills, uh, how much money has gone through nutrition funds. And yes, I pulled my calendar or my calculator and I, I added 15.5 billion plus 5.8 million. But like, I'm not really crunching. I'm, I didn't need Python for that. I didn't need um, SPSS or any of those for that. Um, and I double checked my work because I don't want to get the number wrong when it comes out on a press release later today. Um, but with that being said, there are policy rules that probably aren't going to be on the Hill or they're probably not going to be in a personal office. They might be, let's say maybe like a committee office or, you know, Dominic can speak more about maybe like military intelligence or, you know, maybe more quant work in the state department or like at an agency department of energy for first day where your job is to, again, analyze raw data and synthesize it into something that can be communicated. I think a lot of policy 
and I have a background in scheduling as, as well. And so I tend to think in things in hierarchies and in chain. A lot of policy is turning this into this, making it palpable for folks, making it you know able to be educate, um, you know able to be easily um, absorbed by by whoever your target audience is, whether it's your boss or whether it's the public. And so I think a part of knowing what degree might be right for you, what path towards a degree might be right for you understanding what kind of quant skills could be right for you is knowing what kind of policy you um, would want to get into. And I give, I'll give a brief example, again, to highlight PPIA. Um, so there are five uh, cohorts, five um, junior summer institutes that students can go to, um, and each one kind of provides their own thing. So I was at Carnegie Mellon, um, and Carnegie Mellon, um, the Heinz College, is historically known for um, being very quantitative, heavy, real big focus more in kind of local government and governance. And so doing a lot of, G uh, exactly, I don't even know the terms anymore, but it's a GSS, like geospatial map overlays, doing a lot of uh, PSSS, I think I've only used once um, at the University of Florida, compared to a school like the um, International School uh, at Princeton. Um, don't know what their new title is going to be, if you guys have been following updates. Um, it used to be called the Wilson School as of 48 hours ago. Um, and they are a little bit less quant heavy, a little bit more qualitative heavy, um, more kind of big picture and how you can apply your software skills to, to make an impact in, in policy. So I think as you all go through your journey, figuring out what kinds of things you want to do, like I know that I never want to be um, a, um, you know, down in the trees, crunching numbers policy analyst, but they are just as important as the, the last step of the mouthpiece to a member of Congress to the president or to the public. And so just knowing which part of that chain you want to be in is, I think, really critical. Yeah, um, Christian, I'm, I'm glad you brought up, um, you know, that, that last piece, the, the Wilson School thing, I found hilarious. I, so I graduated from uh, um, Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs for my uh, graduate degree. And it's not as quant heavy as some schools, but it is, it has a very hefty quant component. And um, a lot of my, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, classmates went on to work in what I call like government tangential jobs, like not public service exactly, but they work for these big consulting firms like Deloitte and others. And uh, they do so much of the government analysis work, uh, like so much of our internal government um, number crunching, et cetera. It's not done by, you know, people like, like me, who's a generalist right? They're done by people who have these specific skills. And they often get hired from grad schools. And a lot of the grad schools, uh, like the school formerly known as uh, Wilson, um, like uh, SEPA, Columbia, um, you know, Georgetown, the Kennedy School. So, so they, um, they basically farm a lot of these analyst positions out of there. And at least my experience at Columbia is you could be as quant heavy or as quant light to a floor as you like to be. So if you really want to dig in there and be able to put together, you know, like um, uh, look like code and do databases and um, do those deep dive analyses, you can. And you'll meet some of the best like data, you know, professors in the world. And, and heck, you, you might have that after coming out of there. A lot of organizations are realizing now that you can't just have, you know, the quant skills or you can't just have the like general policy skills. They, they look for kind of um, uh, like a synthesis or at least a like policy person who at least understands the basics of, um, you know, um, coding or something. Like I got pretty heavily into you know, so the cybersecurity side of things at, you know, Columbia. And um, um, I, before that, I didn't know a whole lot about cybersecurity, uh, network vulnerabilities, but the school gave me the, you know, skill set to talk to a uh, you know someone who works at FireEye or one of these other private companies that do a lot of government co consulting work and be able to know what they're saying so that I could then back to writing write the report about it and inform you know up the chain so um just moving on really quickly Dominic there's a question here from Sophia she's a first year business student and what is your opinion on getting a dual degree with a JD along with a master's program for foreign service and Sophia if you need to expand there please feel free to unmute yourself yeah you just summed it up for me thank you okay great um, so 
in my foreign service class, there were quite a few people with uh, JDs. Uh, some of them were military JAG officers. Other others, you know, they, um, you know, they, they, they were they were just lawyers, and uh, they, um, and so it's de it's definitely possible. Like I debated myself doing a dual degree for my master's um, between journalism and um, you know international affairs more generally. So uh, my thought is it can't hurt you, but um, it, it's a matter of, like I said, opportunity costs, the extra time and money it takes. Um, that's up to everybody to you know, gauge whether or not um, it's, it's worth the extra time and effort to do that to accomplish your end goal. So, um, it, but, but then again, it does offer flexibility. Like if you decide, hey, there's plan B, I can always become a lawyer. You know, if this other thing doesn't work out, then uh, I can also see how that's beneficial too. That, that's one of my mottos, always have a plan B and C and D. That's not bad Thank advice. you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask each of you to answer this next question because um, I think it'll be uh, interesting to see your different points of view. So this comes from Justin and the question is, is there any literature that you recommend, fiction or nonfiction, for someone interested in public service? And it looks like Dominic maybe wanted to start. <laughs> there was some enthusiasm there, but uh, Christian. Oh, no, I just thought that he included fiction or nonfiction. Because um, I, I found that um, you know fiction can very often uh, foreshadow reality, and so um, there are there, there's um, uh, uh, a lot of things out in the pop culture right now. So the Atlantic Council, um, it, it, they have a program that basically gets gets fiction writers and policy people together to create speculative fiction about what the world is going to look like. And some of it is eerily accurate about like U.S.-China relations. Um, so um, I, I would have to say the uh, ones that have captivated me the most are um, the Expanse novels. So if you, I, I feel like if you want to know what like Elon Musk's you know doings will result in, um, you know, 200 years from now or even 100 years from now, read that book. It's pretty good. And they get into counterterrorism theory. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so real. So. I would say um, for me, sorry, I, I shimmied over to my my closet um, or to my to my um, what's that called to my bookshelf. I uh, didn't want to get up. You would see my shorts. Um, I always want to say that in a Zoom. I figured I would be able to throw that joke with to you all. So um, I I honestly think before I give this recommendation, um, I'm sure that if you have an interest in public service, politics, governance, which if there's time, I wanted to bring up the difference between those three things. That's really important, but I'll, I'll get to that later if um, there's time, um, there's going to be some literature that connects to you. And it's going to connect to you in a way that is going to connect to you personally. So don't read a book because like, that's a book that people told you to read. Uh, one small example is, um, so as I mentioned, my parents are Haitian immigrants. And I've only been once, and it was in 2017, um, during what is called August recess, when members go back to their districts and they work from home. Very big difference than not go, going to work for a month. Um, and I read Dreams from My Father by President Barack Obama, which basically chronic, uh, chronicle logs his um, journey um, without his, you know, Kenyan father growing up in, um, you know, by his white family in Hawaii. And though I can't relate to that, there was something about reading a, a kind of an origin story when he does go to Kenya and me going to Haiti for the first time and thinking kind of about my parents' immigrant journey to the United States that put things in perspective that I wasn't able to for the first 22, 24 years of my life. Um, I think a really good book to read um, at the intersection of politics and public service, though, is Profiles and Courage by uh, President John F. Kennedy. Um, and it really basically brings up several stories of senators throughout history. I think the first one is like early 1800s um, um, senators and actually House members who, against, um, I guess, um, political opportunism, the easiest thing to do, what was most convenient, they actually went the opposite route um, and they did the most difficult thing because they actually believed in the mission of their work. Uh, I think the best example is, you know, former President Adams, after not being so great of a president, actually went to go serve in the House of Representatives again, which I can't imagine ever happening. And so I think having, I'm a, I'm a big history buff. I think the reason why I liked politics and government is just because for me, it's an extension of, of history. And so um, for me, having historical context um, helps me um, figure out what I want to do and how I want to serve in the, in the future. 
Yeah, my answer is really similar to Christian's. When I was, I was actually, I had read the question on the chat and I did the same thing. I was like looking behind me and I have some more books in my room um, and trying to think. I, so I've always been just really drawn to people's stories. And I think that's why I was also involved with the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program on campus. Um, it's always, when I hear people's stories, it's what's kind of brought me back to my why, I think, or reminded me again, why I want to do uh, or work in public service and make a difference in people's lives. So I, the three first uh, kind of memoirs that came to mind for me was um, Sonia Sotomayor's My Beloved World was really uh, powerful to me, um, being the first Latina Supreme Court Justice. Um, I'm sure many of you have already read this, but Michelle Obama's Becoming book was fantastic. Um, especially the part for me I thought that was interesting was um, when she talks about first going into the private sector and working in law and then that kind of what re she realized again which is okay that that eventually wasn't for her um, and she found her space and where she wanted to make her difference down the road um, and Melinda Gates book of moment of lift was really um, inspiring too about what she's doing around the world and again it's I think it's all about like what can you do in your capacity to make a difference you don't have to even work in public service to do acts of service I guess um, and you don't have to work in the government you can work in nonprofit in different organizing spaces and community organizations um, but also for me too I think it's similar to Christian about reading a even if it's fiction, but kind of reading about the immigrant experience or about people of color and their stories. It's for me personally, what has pushed me forward. Like I recently read Americana, um, which is very good. And um, Homegoing is another really good book about um, the black experience and specifically about um, the impacts of slavery. Um, and then lastly, about tying it to policy, um, I'm going to start reading, but I haven't yet, Dr. Paul Ortiz's book, who works at UF, and he wrote um, an African-American and Latinx history um, in the United States. And I am working on policy regarding um, education kind of in the same space. And so I'm really interested to read his book. And I took a couple of his classes when I was at UF that completely changed my life. Um, and maybe don't, I'm not, you know, using what I learned in the classroom every single day um, with my work, but it's always led me back to my why. So um, I would recommend those books. Thank you guys so much. And if everyone is able to look in the chat function, we have a side sidebar going on about the many different television shows. We could also ask about the fictional television shows that we should be watching to learn a little bit more about public service. Um, so I just wanted to give everyone, I think I caught all the questions in the chat box. Um, but I do, as I'm wrapping up here, wanna, anyone wants to raise their hand and ask a final question, please feel free to do so. I wanna respect everyone's time. It's just about three o'clock now. I'm gonna ask my colleague, Dorothy Zimmerman, to put up our next slide. We have some upcoming programs the rest of the summer. The next one is in two weeks on July 14th. Um, and that'll be Public Service Beyond US Borders. And actually, Manuela will be joining us that day um, and talking about the Foreign Service and some other Great opportunities on July 30th. We have a post-grad public service fellowships and more presentation where we'll be talking about Pickering, Wrangell, Foreign, and other opportunities. And finally, on August 6th, we'll have resources to launch your career. Our partners from Beyond 120, Manuela will also join us um, and myself, and we'll be talking about the different opportunities at the Graham Center um, and through some of the other programs at UF and outside of UF, UF's walls that can help you tap into sort of a public service career trajectory. Um, many of those are funded. Lots of the Beyond 120 and Graham Center opportunities have some funding behind them. So when Liana was talking earlier about that piece of things, I think that's really critical to share with you all. And you can register for each of these through our Graham Center website. And finally, just wanna thank Dominic, Christian, and Liana so much for being with us. Really appreciate your time and efforts. And if you all want to share any final thoughts, please feel free. I'd just like to say thank you so much for, you know, inviting us here. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of energizing for someone who's worked in the government to see that, you know, the next generation of people, you know, they have interest in this sector and this kind of work. And uh, also, I wish that the Graham Center existed when I was a student um, way back in the early 2000s. Yeah, again, just thank you for inviting us. Truly appreciate it. I'm always look forward to speaking with students. 
Um, but if any of you, I know they're going to share our contact information afterwards, but if you have specific questions, because I know these are somewhat general, you know, responses, but I'm happy to connect with each and every one of you. Um, so feel free and good luck with everything. I know it's a difficult time that we're all living in right now. So please take care of yourself. Your mental and physical well-being is super important. Um, so just check in with yourself. Absolutely. Just want to say thank you again to the Bob Graham Center. Um, but also thank you to you all for being interested. I, I know I think that's something that's really interesting with public services. A part of it is a good selfishness, right? Like I care about this because I care about this. But that means that you get to do great things through public service if you continue to focus on your why and on your journey. So thank you all for being here. Um, and also just kind of one thing I, I want to leave with you all is just to you know, remember to, to give forward. Um, the same way that, you know, I didn't know I was going to be at this panel five years ago when I was coming out of a Bob Graham experience. You know, you're going to be in, you know, Dominic's shoes or Liana's shoes or maybe my shoes in one year, five years, 10 years. And so I think an important part of service, public service that isn't really talked about is, is giving forward. So educating and mentoring uh, that next generation is, is critical. So thank you again and, and go Gators. Thank you all so much. Just a quick uh, moment. Our uh, director, Matt Jacobs, would like to just say a quick thank you. So Matt? Hi everyone, I'm Matt Jacobs, Director of the Graham Center. I've been listening in here. Leana and Dominic and Christian, this was fantastic. We really appreciate you, you doing this. Uh, this is one of the first efforts to really try to do, first of all, some summer programming for us. Uh, and I think it's really critical that we offer some opportunities over the summer, but also to do something virtually, uh, organized from the start as a virtual uh, program. And you guys were just absolutely fantastic, e each one of you. And I, I really, really appreciate your contributions uh, here today and your support and service to our students. It, it is absolutely fantastic. And I couldn't be more delighted with this. Thank you so much. All right. And with that, I will let everyone sign out. I'm going to stay here in case anyone has any questions for the Graham Center um, and to save the chat feature so I can share all those great resources with you all. Thank you so much and have a good day. Thank you all. Dominic, are you still there, by the way? You're muted. I'm sorry. Hi. Yeah, sorry. Yes. No, I just wanted as a sidebar to say I watched that Star Trek show as well. And oh, I'm wondering wow. how many people as well as we did. It's yeah. I actually use that in like professional like applications for things and talks because truly Patrick Stewart is a, a yeah. like legitimate role model for me in that role. So <laughs> glad there's another Trekkie out there.